Tonight's guest is Adolf Santa Steven. He goes by AD, though. AD, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Good afternoon. You threw me when you said good afternoon because it's night here. But then again, you're way out west, so there's a three-hour time difference. But thanks for saying that anyway. AD, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Basically, I'm an outdoor person. I like going up in the mountains, fishing. Uh, I used to like camping quite a bit. But when I go fishing, it's always during the day. Uh, I have to be home before it gets dark, for sure. I can't drive at night. But, uh, yeah, I like exploring. Uh, I like uh, listening to Bigfoot stories, Thunderbirds, Dogman. Uh, I'm always a curious person. Anywhere I go, I look down for tracks on the sandbar or trails. I'm always looking around, and I always take a lot of photos with my cell phone. But once I get home, I always zoom in on it all the time, and even everybody else's photographs, because I end up finding stuff that they missed. And most of the photos I take is because I I get a feeling that something's there or something's looking at me. So those are the areas I take photos a lot. So I always end up finding something that's strange. And, uh, yeah, there's one spot I need to go to by Courtright. It's an overhang. There's a big X. In there, looks like there's two statues and two boulders that are rectangle shape and with a flat section on top. And it's about a mile away from the road. And only way you could see it is from top of one of the domes, granite domes. And I just happened to be taking photos, and that's how I found it by zooming in in that area later on. And I need to check out this area. It's like a megalith type structure i don't think anybody's ever been there i google earth that area there's no trails to it whatsoever i don't see no trash or anything but this place is old but that's one of the places i want to go pretty soon and uh hopefully when alan thomas from swatch zone gets better we could use this drone so we don't have to walk all the way to it, maybe part of the way, and then use the drone to zoom in on it, find out what's there. But, yeah, I've always been a curious uh, person. I got Navajo in me also, so to me that's a big plus because it makes me more aware of what's around my surroundings. Yeah, I like outdoors big time. Considering all the experiences you've had, I'd say it's a good thing that you're very aware of your surroundings because you've got quite the collection of experiences. AD, you're here tonight because you saw the same big dog man last week's guest, Javier, saw. How far was the spot where you saw it from where he did? Where he's seen it, probably two and a half miles. Yeah, about two and a half miles. Up the river where I was at. Yeah, that's not that far then. No, not at all. How much time had gone by when you saw it compared to when he did? I'm trying to remember the time. She told me about it. I'll say about, probably about six months. So that much time had gone by. How did you meet Javier? Uh, actually, I met him through... Uh, I used to be interviewed quite a bit with Paranormal Central. It's Jeff Garcia. Uh, he has a show here in Fresno called Paranormal Central. And uh, in fact, he's the one that uh, tried to find us because they heard about our story. And this is before we even started making a movie about it. And uh, he tracked us down. He heard about our story at a party. <laughs> Ended up, it was one of my coworkers at work that told him the story. Because he, that coworker, supposed to have gone with us camping, but at the last minute, he decided not to go. Good thing. 
But yeah, there must have been one other person and he didn't make it. Then we end up telling him the story. Went to a party. Jeff was there. He's related to him somehow. And uh, then Jeff tracked us down. And uh, our first interview was Paranormal Central. Yeah, I'd say it was a good thing they didn't go camping with you that time. We're going to get into that while we're saying that after we talk about your dog man encounter, though. Yeah, that's a pretty detailed story right there in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Me and Javier, I met him through Paranormal Central. And, uh, yeah, we just started liking the places that he was going. And, I mean, I'm quite a bit older than he is. So I, a lot of these places I already knew before he went to them. So I started showing him some of the places, me and Alan started showing some of the places that were kind of tripped out. And then he expanded from there and started doing his own thing. But uh, yeah, Javier is a really good guy, nice guy. He showed us some interesting places I didn't know about about some rock painting you should ask him about that that's his story and he took us there and it's a big panel of old rock paintings and there's uh, also a thunderbird painted on there a pterodactyl type bird that's painted on this big rock and it's probably about 15 feet across uh it's it's a pretty good design and it's old and whoever painted it they did it on the right area because it's facing east all our storms come from the west and it has a slight overhang hang so it's protected by the weather and rain and areas that aren't protected you can see where the red paint got washed away a little bit or not as bright but yeah, we end up finding that out on the way back. We're trying to locate it because he heard stories about it and we're almost giving up. Started coming off that mountain, came around the corner, looked behind this tree and all of a sudden, boom, there it was. And then also there's a, there's a rock that looks like part of it was carved out part of it not everything but it's also painted and it looks like a bigfoot that's painted you know hundreds or thousands of years ago and it's like from the shoulder above it shows like a bigfoot head right there and on the side of the face it has a picture of a shaman and i went to google started looking at old Indian paintings and stuff. And I found a picture of a shaman ended up. It was the same type of design that's on the side of the Bigfoot's face. Wow. That sure does sound like an awfully neat area. You're a lucky man to be living out there. All right, AD, please tell us about your encounter. Now give us every last detail that comes to mind. All righty. One day, well, the day before, actually, I called up uh, Alan Thomas. He has his own uh, show called Squatch Zone. So we always end up going out, driving to places, checking out places. We really can't walk really that good. His knees are bad, and I got one bad one, but I tried to do the best I could. So I called him up, told him, let's take a drive. You know, bring your drone and your cameras, and uh, we'll go out exploring again. So uh, we decided to go by Pine Flat Dam, Avocado Lake area, Kings River, which is all within the same area, 10 square miles easily within that area. And there's a lot of uh, orange groves and lemon groves in that area. So got in his car. And uh, started driving. We also heard of uh, Bigfoots. They like hanging out in the lemon groves and orange groves. And there's, it's easy for them to hide in there. You know, you have to look down the roads. A lot of times if they see a, hear a car coming, they'll just hide behind a tree. You don't even know they're there. 
So as we're driving, we're always looking between the orange groves, you know, and lemon groves, and uh, see if we could find anything. But we never do. But there's been reports of them being in that area. So as we're driving, we're always checking out places and stuff. If we see deers, we'll stop. We'll take a video of it or a photo of it, especially because I could show my daughter. She likes animals. So we always stop if there's any kind of animals. But as we're driving down Bellman Avenue, we live in Presno County, California, and uh, we're driving toward Pine Flat Dam. And the road starts getting kind of weavy a little bit, not bad. On the left-hand side of us, after the orange groves, it's foothills. To the right is the river, which is a little downwards past the lemon groves. So as we're driving, there's a sharp turn, and there's a turnout right there. So we got out. We're going to check out the places. And we're always looking for footprints, any kind of animal tracks. We always try to figure out what it is. But there's a trail that goes to the top of the hill, which is about 200 feet or so. 200 feet of a walk, I mean. But on a straight line, it's probably about 60 feet above our heads, I think. But it's about 200 feet walk. And uh, so we're going to walk up there. And I don't remember if we're going to use the drone or not. I think it was too windy. And uh, we didn't use it, but we're looking for tracks. And I told them that I was going to go behind the lemon grove and the river right there. There's a, a dirt road for tractors carry their the boxes of lemons and oranges to the packing house, which is on the other side, about a mile away or so. But I walk off this hill and climb over a fence, get to that dirt road. And on the left-hand side of the road is the river, but between me and the river, there's ornamental plants that people planted. Well, I guess the owner did. He had some plants there i never seen before. And I went to Reedley College for horticulture and forestry. So plants always catch my interest. So trying to figure out what, what kind they are. So uh, after I look at the plants, I kept on walking west. And I'm looking down for tracks. Alan stayed up there. At that time, he couldn't walk very good. So I kept on walking. And uh, there's an embankment that goes down to the left that goes down, I don't know, 8 feet, 10 feet, something like that. And uh, kind of like a steep angle. And I'm using a walking stick. And there's all kinds of dry Grass is probably about two feet tall, two and a half feet tall. And there's a somewhat of a trail. And you could tell it's not used very much at all. So I started walking down toward the river, which is only about 75 feet away. And I could hear the water, the rapids. And uh, the trail splits up into a T or a Y. I was going to make a right, but I seen all kinds of poison oak over there. I go, nah, I don't want to walk to that. So I made a left. And as I was walking, the trail goes upwards a little bit, about two and a half, three feet on this little hill of the embankment. Then it makes a sharp right. So as I'm walking, I'm looking straight. So, you know, thinking that the trail goes down and goes straight, but it don't, it makes a sharp right. So as I got to the top of the hill, I turned my head to the right. Well, I look down, look at the trail. I see it turn to the right. So I'm looking to the right, and all of a sudden, I'm looking at a back end of something. I'm looking at it eye level. I'm looking at the shoulder, the back muscles of the shoulder blades of something. And they had gray, whitish black hair and it was like the white was underneath but you could see it because the wind was blowing a little bit so it's like the inner part of the hair i guess and the tips are black and the tips also had grayish but what caught my eye was that white color first and i'm going like for a quick second i go what 
you know, what is that? You know, my mind's going so quick. And that thing did not hear me because of the rapids of the water. I snuck up on it by accident. And all this is going it through my head, you know, a tenth of a second real quick. You know, what is it? What is it, you know? And then all of a sudden, I guess it heard me. Some or felt I was there or something. And all of a sudden, his shoulder starts turning. And I seen the edge of his snout. It, I, I didn't know what it was. And then I seen the edge of that snout, but it wasn't like a Jim or Shepherd. It was more like a, a pit bull. It was shorter uh, snout. It wasn't pointy, but it definitely had a snout, sort of like a pit bull. And you could see the muscles on the back as it's turning. And I seen the partial of the head and the snout. And right before I started seeing the eyes, I turned around. I started running. And I got a bad knee. I fell down about 50 feet. Once I started running, my leg, my right leg gave out. Got back up. Started running. And then I turned around to see if he was after me, but it, I couldn't turn a good enough angle. Whereas I could see if it was behind me or not. I just wanted to get out of there. And so I started climbing up the sides of the embankment. Once I got to the top, I turned around, entered up. I didn't see him. But it was like a Bucks Bunny cartoon when you're running and you're running, moving your legs up in the air. That's what I was doing. <laughs> and uh, I just started trying to run as fast as I could. And in high school and in junior high, I used to, I used to run a lot. I was a track star back then. But uh, they don't tell you when you run a lot, you mess up your knees. But, uh, yeah, I used to be a pretty good runner. But I started running, and it's – I'm probably running about – 50 yards and uh, I'm looking back as I'm going and I'm trying to grab rocks as I'm going. So just in case it's behind me, I could throw it at it. So as I'm running, I'm trying to grab something, stop for a quick second when I see a good sized rock and I didn't look behind me. I was just grabbing rocks. And uh, finally, Alan heard me screaming and stuff because i was calling out his name and he's looking at me like what you know what's going on and i was breathing so hard i had to lean against the fence post and i had a hard time explaining to him at that moment till i you know till i could catch my breath and uh yeah this thing was huge I'm five feet nine. So if I'm looking at his back between his shoulder blades, add another probably foot and a half. So he's probably a good seven and a half feet tall, muscular, big time. Uh, I didn't see his legs or anything because I started running right when he started turning his head. It wasn't a big foot. It wasn't a werewolf. It was a dog man. Yeah, and I didn't smell nothing because of the way the wind was blowing. So, and I don't think he smelled me either. I think he just felt that something was there. But yeah, it was, uh, I won't go back there again. Another place, not by myself. Can't say I blame you after an experience like that. Wow. How far did you say Alan was from you when you walked up on that dog man, A.D.? He was probably about 300 feet away. Maybe a bit more. Because he couldn't see me because the river starts curving there. And the orange grove a little bit. So he couldn't see me at that angle to I was, you know, parallel toward him where he could look at me down the road. 
But yeah, we end up going back and Ellen took some videos showing the place. And there's also been other reports, uh, fishermen. Matter of fact, we're with uh, Paranormal Center with his group because they he heard stories of a dog man in that area also. So as we're down there, we're between uh, the lemon groves. There's a creek that goes through a well, seasonal creek, but it ate up the soil over the years. So it's down about 15 feet. So we're trying to climb the side, get to the other side of it and uh, climbing the embankment. And also this guy and the fisherman, he has all kinds of nice equipment, nice fishing vests, two poles hanging off the edge, real good stuff that he had. And uh, they ask him, you know, have you heard or seen anything strange over here? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, uh, I don't know what it is. He goes, but it walks on all fours, and when the deer start running, it gets up and runs on two. And he sees it from a distance. And this is a fisherman we never met before. I mean, he was calm and collected. But he said it had the same color hair as the deers. So it blended in with them when it was laying down with them. And the deers were not scared of him. And that caught me kind of trippy that why would they hang out with them unless that dog man was a pup and hung out with deers and it grew up with them. I don't know. But uh, he said it's tall and it walks on two, but sometimes it walks on all fours. And he said, it's, it's not a dog. It's not a deer. I don't know what it is, but he's seen it a couple of times. And he's aware of it. He's the one that told us about it. And reason he's going to a pond that's behind the orange, uh, orange live in the uh, packet house. And I Googled that area, ended up there is a pond there, and there's a small dam. And he said he always goes fishing there because he catches his limit. All the fish get stuck right there behind the dam. So as he's going home, he stops by there, goes fishing for a while, takes it home and have it for dinner, he said. If he's had more than one run-in with that dog man and he still goes into that area, he definitely doesn't frighten easily, does he? Yeah, it was. The river splits up right where that hill was at, the King's River. And there's an island. And the King's River, they end up meeting together farther down the road. So it's really hard to get into that island. And it's pretty dense. Uh, I can't even zoom in on anything. There's just so much trees and, and shrubs and everything that you can't really see if there's any structures or anything. So if anything wants to hide, that's the place to do it. And the dog man probably could walk across the river with no problem. And uh, that's his hiding place. No human could walk across that river. Sounds like the perfect place for it to hang out. Yeah. And that's probably where they're hiding at. And that would be a perfect place. There's no roads, no trails. You have to cross the river to even get in there. And uh, that's probably where he hangs out at. And he, the dog man probably didn't hear me because of the wraps of the water. And that's the reason I was able to snuck up on him by accident. And he was only about six, seven feet away. Close. Yeah, real close. That's the reason I ran. I wasn't about to stick around. Yeah, he probably would have got me right then and there. Yeah, he probably just got as scared as I did. He probably went across the river. That's the reason I didn't see him running behind me, because he got startled just like I did. I ran one way, he ran the other. <laughs> he probably <laughs> never seen a human close to him before. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That would be awfully funny if you did wind up startling him. When he finally realized that you were standing there, did he jump like it did startle him as he was turning around? No, he just uh, turned around slowly, his head and his shoulder. First, his shoulders start turning, then his head. And as soon as I seen that perfect angle, that snout, oh, no, I'm out of here. 
And the hair was probably about four to six inches long, straight. It was in a, well, at least on his back, it was in a, you know, wavy or anything. That sounds like something straight out of a nightmare. I've had nightmares like that where you're behind the monster and you're terrified it's going to turn around. And for you to be six, seven feet behind that dog, man, and all of a sudden it slowly starts to turn, I can only imagine the thoughts going through your head. Yeah, I never thought about that way. Yeah, it was just like a movie. I mean, it was, it just caught me off guard big time. And I caught him off guard or her, whatever it was. But yeah, now I think about it, I think it ran across the river. And I ran the opposite direction. That's the reason I didn't see it behind me. You might be right, but I'd be surprised if it actually did run across the river. Sounds to me like it didn't startle it. It just stayed right there where it was or just moved off, but I'd be really surprised if it startled it. You even mentioned that it didn't jump or anything like that when it came to realize you were there, it just slowly turned. So I don't think it did frighten them. Yeah, you're probably right because I didn't stick around to find out for sure. (laughs) I know he wasn't following me and I'm happy about that. (laughs) I don't blame you. Don't blame you at all. Now, A.D., every time it seems like you have an eyewitness come on the show and talk about an experience like this where there you are, there the dogman is, seems like there are tons of people who pose the question, okay, if you're that close to the dogman, I don't understand why you didn't take a picture of the dogman. So I want to give you the opportunity to address that crowd who's wondering that right now. You know, you're, you're, you're so startled. You don't believe what you're seeing. I mean, the first thing you want to think about is protecting yourself. You don't even think about taking a photo, uh, trying to prove anything to anybody. You just want to, I mean, it's an act of nature. You have to survive. So you need to get out of there as fast as you can so you could tell the story later. You're not worried about taking photos because I didn't have a chance anyway. I was running as soon as I seen the nozzle, the snout on it. I was gone. So, yeah, the last thing you want to think about is taking a photo. You know, unless you're at distance from it, you know, good distance, and you can zoom in on it, great. But when you walk up to it and six, seven feet away from you, Ah, oh, no, that's the last thing you want to think about. You just want to save your life. Oh, of course. Anyone who can't understand that, I just don't know what to think about them. Because, yeah, it's only common sense. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Now, if you wanted to take a picture of it for whatever reason, did you have anything on you that you could have done that with? I had my cell phone in my uh, shirt pocket. But I didn't pull it out or anything. I was gone. Oh, of course you were. I don't blame you. Anyone in the right mind would have been gone. (laughs) You didn't know anything about what you're walking up on. Bam, there it is. So that's totally understandable. At that time, you have no concept of taking a photo. (laughs) (laughs) Well, of course you didn't. It's like the same thing. You get a cat, you put a pot of water and you put the cat over and you drop it. As soon as that cat hits the water, it jumps out and runs away. Basically, that's the same thing I did. You know, you see it and you're, <laughs> you're running after that. There's no thinking, you know? No, oh, of course not. <laughs> no, you just react. Yeah, yeah, that's natural. I'm a little confused on this. When you walked up on it, was it crouching or standing up straight? Now it was standing up straight, but hunching over a little. So his back was, his shoulder to the top of the head was hunched over a little bit. I don't know if he was looking for uh, blackberries, because there's blackberry bush right next to it. And they were in season. So it was probably getting, that's what it was trying to get. Unless it was trying to get a fish. But when we went back later, explored that area, a lot of the grass was growing in the water. So unless a fish gets stuck in there, 
you know, maybe he was standing up from bending over trying to grab something, but I don't think so. I think he was going for the blackberry bush right next to him. Could you tell if it was actually standing in the water or if it was definitely standing on the bank? It wasn't standing in the water. Could you tell if it had anything in its hands at the time? No. No, I didn't even see the hands. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you didn't, and I understand why. Hey, the only thing I seen was between the shoulder blades. It was at eye level, and it was standing about two and a half, three feet below me. And I'm looking at the back. And as soon as it started turning his shoulders, I seen the snout. I was gone. I wasn't about to stay any longer. But it was standing up for sure. Yeah, I'll bet you were setting some land speed records that day. Since you got such a good look at its back, were there any special anatomical features about its back that you could tell us about? You could see the muscles. When it started turning back, you could see every muscle just standing out in the back and on the shoulders. And uh, on the head, had longer hair. Had longer hair, probably about six to eight inches, something like that. From the forehead going backwards, well, the angle that I seen. But the forehead, because I, I didn't see the whole head. So I seen parts of it because I was, I was dumbfounded. So I seen it start moving and it's like, what is it? It took me a, you know, hundreds of a second, but it seemed like it took forever trying to diagnose what it is. But it, it, it was muscular big time. And the snout had, a little darker color on it. It had more black and a shorter black hair. And it wasn't like a German Shepherd. It was just like a, a pit bull. A shorter snout uh, that prolonged out. Uh, it didn't look like no um, Bigfoot or... No, this, this was totally different. You said it felt like you were standing there for ages. Thinking back on it, how long do you think you actually were standing there? Uh, okay, right when I got to it, looking at it, maybe two seconds. Even that, I was gone. I mean, he's only seven feet away. You know, the longest part was me looking at his back, trying to figure out what it was. Till it started turning his shoulders, then I seen the snout at that angle, and he wasn't totally turned around yet. I just seen enough, and I turned around to start running. I wasn't about to stick around. You are probably cracking 40 miles an hour getting back to Allen. <laughs> Falling down. Yeah, when I got to the top of the embankment, that's where I hurt my knee even more. So I was running more of a with a limp once I was on flat ground, but I was still running. But yeah, it, uh, yeah, I won't go there again unless I go with people. Well, I can understand that. If you were only about 300 feet or so from Alan when this happened, did you ever think about shouting out for him? Well, I was as I was running. <laughs> also, you were yelling the whole way and not just when you got closer. No, he couldn't hear me anyway. I was trying to yell, but I was so out of breath. You know, I was making horse sounds out of my head. <laughs> out of my mouth. <laughs> I, I couldn't talk whatsoever. The only thing you hear was... <laughs> trying to say his name. <laughs> oh, I'll bet you were. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to get, get out of there as fast as I could, as safe as I could. I was out of there. I wasn't about to stick around and taking a photo of it. There's no way. I mean, even somebody that was 50 feet away probably would have ran and not took a photo of it. Oh, of course they would. 
They're big. Yes, they are. Before we continue with tonight's show, I want to make an announcement. I've been in contact with several content creators who interview Dogman eyewitnesses, and I've arranged what I call five nights of Dogman encounters. That means from tonight until Halloween night, every night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, you're going to have new shows of Dogman-related content to look forward to. And on every night except Sunday night, there's going to be a 10 p.m. show as well. To see a schedule for all the shows who are going to participate and find links to their channels, please go to the description for tonight's show. A lot of good shows are going to participate in the Five Nights of Dogman, so I hope you listen to their shows and, of course, subscribe to their channels. All right, back to tonight's show. At the start of the show, you said that you don't go out after dark. Is that because of that encounter or another reason? No, reason I don't go at night because of uh, alien encounters I had in the past. So I don't drive at night whatsoever. Street lights scare me because I don't know if it's really a street light or it's something else. If it's a different type of light that's showing out. But yeah, I don't, uh, I have to be home before it gets dark. Only time I drive when it's dark is going to work, and that's early in the morning. So yeah, because I have to be at work at six. So that's the only time I ever drive at night whatsoever. Anywhere I go to I have to plan to be at home before it gets dark. Everybody knows that. All family members, all my friends. So I don't even drive far anymore. If I do, I know I have to time it and I got a place to stay once I'm there. But driving at night, no way. I haven't done that since the encounters I had. Yeah, considering those encounters and experiences, I don't blame you for not going out after dark. And speaking of those, you're featured in a documentary called 101102 due to those experiences. What more can you tell us about it? Well, there's some stuff that are missing because uh lack of time. The most we could go was uh, one hour, 59 minutes. The movie's about 55 minutes, something seconds, I forgot. But if we put everything in there that we wanted to, probably would have been another hour. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that will make more sense on the movie if everything else was on there. I'll give you some short little stories. It was three of us. Yeah, and everybody out there, check out the movie. It's called 101102. Write down the letters, not the numbers. And uh, you'll see it in there. And uh, yeah, after we came back and everything, Kenneth, he drove with me because I'm the one that picked him up. And as soon as I took him to the house, he lived upstairs while apartment. Uh, he didn't even get his items out of my vehicle. He got out, he ran and uh, started call calling out his girlfriend's name. She opened up the door. As soon as he got in and I was behind him, he started taking off his clothes. He left his underwear on, but he started taking off his clothes. He's yelling at his girlfriend, check my body for marks. Check my body. Check everywhere. She's laughing. You know, she didn't know what was going on until she seen his face that, you know, he was serious. And I looked at her. I go, yeah, check him. He goes, some weird stuff happened up there. And, uh, yeah, he's yelling, and she's checking every part of his body, if there's any marks or anything like that. And that was the last time he went with us. And he loves the mountains. He was from Seattle, Washington. Matter of fact, he had uh, UFOs uh, chase him while he lived up there, while he was on the back end of a motorcycle in Seattle. And uh, he told me that they were going down the road and this UFO was right behind him and above him. And as they were going down the street, he was yelling at people, UFO, UFO, and he's pointing behind him. But by that time, it was already gone. But uh, it was after him right before they got to Seattle. So they were still in the country. And uh, yeah, he started yelling when he got to the first uh, streetlight. 
but yeah, he, uh, he had some encounters over there. But yeah, after that trip, he uh, didn't hang out with us. And uh, he didn't want to talk about it whatsoever. He ended up getting uh, cancer. And we don't know if that had to do with it, what happened at the trip or not. We have no idea. But yeah, he passed away. And um, yeah, poor guy. Real cool guy. Sounds like he really went through it. Yeah, he just likes the mountains. Outdoors. He likes a lot of Indian stuff. He used to make things and give it to me. And uh, he used to like gold panning, which I do also at times. When I do have time, I go. And I always end up finding more gold than him, and he used to get mad at me. (laughs) (laughs) I used to tease him, look what I found, Kenneth. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, yeah, I used to tease him like that. But, yeah, after that, he wasn't the same. Ken wasn't the same also for a while. Now he's back to normal. Took a while, but yeah, on the film where you see his eyes all bugged out and everything, that's when he was in shock still. Uh, He was like that for quite a while. And I was kind of used to it, so it didn't affect me as bad as Ken. But on the film, when it first starts, you can see his eyes are all bugged out. He's talking really fast. Normally, that's not him. That's a different Ken. Yeah, he was still in shock. And that's all he wanted to talk about was that trip. And uh, I got tired of talking about it, you know. But uh, it happened. But, you know, it affects me in different ways. You know, I can't drive at night. He could. He bought a house up in the mountains, (laughs) which I wouldn't have. (laughs) Wow. Uh, He ended up selling it later, but... Yeah, I mean, it was it was sort of like his way of uh, facing the truth, being back up in the mountains and living there. We went camping one time after that trip, the same place, just to face our fears. Uh, we only lasted one night. Nothing happened. It was just too eerie. Uh, didn't feel comfortable no more. Uh, we just packed up in the morning. You know, we're gone. Um, but what I do, well, what I did over there, I made a alien rock man. So with granite rocks that are in that area, I made, uh, on the ground, I made a, a alien with rocks. So every time I go up there, I'll fix the rocks in the right place because the snow and rain will move the rocks around. But yeah, I always end up fixing it. And uh, now I know a couple of people that go up there that we met up there by accident. They recognized me and uh, we showed them the spot entered up. They thought that was a spot. So we end up having a barbecue there, him and all his buddies and ended up. They had a, a UFO encounter during that night. So they were telling me about it, telling me and Ken about it. And, uh, one of the guys just walked away. I go, what's wrong with him? He goes, he doesn't want to hear it. He goes, he got mad at us because he wanted to leave last night because of the lights. And they drove, I don't know where they drove from, but it was a lot farther than we did. And he goes, no, we just got here. We're not leaving because of some light. So he didn't want to hear our story, you know, especially being in the same camping spot. So he just walked away. You know, he, he didn't want to hear it whatsoever. But uh, so now they go there. Every time they go there now, they go out there and fix the rock alien man that I got out there at the campsite. So that's how people will find it. I noticed what you're saying about Ken's eyes at the start of the movie. They really were bugging out. And as the movie went on and I started seeing him again and again, I thought, okay, well, he looks a lot different there than he did at the start of the film. So. I was wondering about that. Yeah, he was in shock. That part was recorded uh, when we first started doing the filming. And it it took us like 10 years to do this film. 
because we had to do it on my friend's nephew time. And, uh, you know, he travels around the world doing films for people. So whenever he had, you know, a little bit of time, he'll travel to Fresno and he lives in San Francisco. So anytime he, you know, had a few days, he'll come down here and then that's if it matches my time. Cause I used to work a lot of overtime. So we had to match everything right when we're doing the filming. And also on the filming, me and Kim were always interviewed separate. And we never told each other what they're asking us. So that's the reason on the film, you never, you never see us together. Because everything, I wanted to say my story. I wanted Kim to say his and then at the end of the movie, when they start editing everything, see if everything matched up, ended up it did. You passed that lie detector test as well. Yeah. Even when we did that, I went outside, so I wouldn't hear nothing. And he did the same thing. So, yeah, we're never together. That's a really good idea. Yeah. The name of the documentary is 101102, like we said, and I'm going to put a link to it in the description for tonight's show. That'll make it real easy to find. But having said that, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yeah, there's a lot of things out there or energy or, you know, different dimensions that we're not aware of. Some people are aware of it, you know, that's really sensitive. And I call myself pretty sensitive, but not compared to a lot of other people. But uh, if you get a bad sense not to be in a certain area, don't fight it. Use your senses. If it says not to go there, don't go there. That's your uh, your human part trying to tell you that there's something wrong. Yeah, just be safe. Always tell people where you're going. Never go alone. Give them a timetable when you may be back. Or a rough idea. But always go by your senses at all times. Life goes on. It's just how you handle it later. As for me, I handle it by not going out at night at all. So that's my fear factor right there. But, yeah, you just go day by day, keep going on with your life. But always remember there's something else out there that we're not aware of. That's right. There always is. If you've had a Dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com. Well, it goes without saying, I sure hope someday you can go back out at nighttime and not be so anxious about what might happen or what might be out there, but please don't rush it. But having said that, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of your encounter with us. I really appreciate it. Pleasure meeting you. Well, it's great to meet you. Thanks again so much for your time and have a great night.